Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. It's Way T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And I'm excited to record this one because I've just got back from the Christmas holidays. And we have an extraordinary guest to join us today. None other than Ashley Van Houten. And she has done a lot of different things. She's an author, a speaker, podcast host, and self-proclaimed muscle nerd. I love that. I think you <laughs> claim a space. I like to be a muscle nerd is really cool. In fact, she wrote a cookbook called It Takes Guts. And we're going to talk about that. And is the host of the Muscle Maven radio podcast. She is a longtime contributor to Paleo Magazine, and Ashley is also a consultant in the fitness industry, helping others build their brand and communicate their messages to the world. Working with notable figures like legendary Canadian bodybuilder and life optimization guru Ben Pakulski, great guy. He's been uh, associated with Bioptimus for a long time. I love his work. Fantastic guy. And thyroid health expert, L. Russ, who has been a guest of the podcast, not once, but twice. In her downtime, Ashley is a nationally ranked natural figure competitor and also dabbles in powerlifting, arm wrestling, and BJJ. Although her biggest hobby is trying to convince people to eat organ meat. So we're going to talk about that today. Ashley, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. This was a, a very positive and upbeat intro. I feel like I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to take on the world now. Appreciate Sweet. it. So um, let's start at the beginning for people who haven't heard of your podcast or maybe your book. We'll get into some of that stuff later. But so uh, we're both Canucks. That's uh, that's Canadian speak for Canadians. And she is in the freezing cold of Ottawa here in the middle of the winter. I've yes. escaped recently to the warm tropical shores of Southern California. But tell me about your journey um, to kind of become the person that you're. So how did you get into this whole industry, the fitness industry? How did you become a muscle maven? Mm -hmm. How did you get into all these different things? And, and what made you become a muscle nerd? All right. Well, um, first of all, I'm jealous that you are in Southern California. Um, and I also think it's really kind of cool how like this industry, the fitness wellness uh, world is is still a relatively small one, um, but I just keep running into awesome Canadians everywhere I go, which makes me really happy. So it's always kind of fun to connect with other Canucks. So anyway, I appreciate that. Um, I don't I don't really have like kind of a cool elevator speech light bulb moment about how I got into this industry. It's really, I growing up, I guess I had older brothers. And so I watched a lot of like wrestling and Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and stuff. And I just, I kind of always liked muscle and and strength and displays of strength i liked watching like world's strongest man and you know i just liked seeing what the human body was capable of i was always fascinated with that from a young age um and while i was never i never really considered myself much of an athlete growing up i did do things like gymnastics and swimming and i always was kind of involved in in sports that required body awareness and things like that but I, I wasn't really like a team sport person so much not as good with a ball as I was kind of doing things on my own so um, I didn't really consider myself an athlete until I really got out of university and found at the time um, it was sort of the early days of CrossFit and I found that because I was always sort of a, a gym rat like I always was in the gym working out because of the whole I love muscles thing um, but I wanted something that was a little bit more like a sport and a little bit more like a community thing. And so I got into that and I kind of started realizing like, Hey, just cause I, I didn't play like, you know, I don't know, volleyball or whatever. Maybe I am an athlete. Maybe I can be an athlete. And so I started really kind of diving into a lot of the stuff, um, that makes CrossFit so great, which is sort of powerlifting and um, weightlifting and just the, the concepts of hypertrophy and things like that. So I really started educating myself on these things um, personally while I was going to school and working and doing what, what people do. And I uh, went to school for communications and PR and I was working in a corporate uh, environment at the time. 
and starting to realize I was living in New York and starting to realize that maybe I didn't want to work in that kind of environment. You know, I didn't really want to put a suit on every day and, and work crazy long hours in an industry that I didn't love. Um, and so I had started the kind of painstaking process of trying to, and I realize this doesn't work for everybody. I'm fortunate that it worked for me, but kind of connect the things that I was passionate about and I loved with the things I was good at doing, which is, you know, researching and interviewing and, and learning from people and, and gathering that information and giving it to others and um, just communication, right? And so um, I started, again, it was painstaking. It was like a long process, but I started doing things like writing for the CrossFit Games and connecting with Paleo Magazine and writing for them. And, and that was like this huge cascade effect where I got to connect and meet with so many people in the nutrition space and the wellness space and just learning from all of these people. And, and then I started getting, um, well, I had the opportunity to host um, Paleo Magazine's podcast at the time, which I didn't know anything about how to do that. But of course I said, yes, cause I'm like, hey, I like to talk and you know, I get to learn from people for a living now. So, you know, this was taking sort of years and years and I was taking all kinds of courses and educating myself, but really a lot of it was just diving into this world that again, I would have been doing it for free, but I was slowly painstakingly making it a, a living. Um, and so that's really kind of just continued to steamroll and evolve and, you know, with the work with some of these folks that you mentioned earlier. And, um, and it's just now actually in the past like couple of years that I've started to continue to branch off and create my own stuff. Um, because for a long time, it was about how much can I learn from other people? Um, how much can I help other people kind of, um, expand their brand and, and do the work that they do. And now I've kind of made the switch with my book and some of the work that I'm doing, trying to really create my own, my own brand and my own products, my own services, and, and really help people in the areas that I'm particularly passionate about, which is things like functional strength, um, nutrient dense diets that make people feel good um, and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a, a million little things. Um, and I'm, I'm so fortunate and grateful that I get to do it because I just get to learn about stuff that I love and, and talk to smart, awesome people who want to help others all the time. It's just such a great environment to be in. So I feel very lucky. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all that. So couple interesting components and I want to get to let's dive right into it because I think a lot of people you've written a book it's called it takes guts and you're a, a big advocate of leveraging uh, eating nutrient dense foods such as organ meats my business partner is a big advocate of that and of course it has a long history particularly in Chinese medicine in the bodybuilding industry you can go back to um you can go back to the wild physique in Vince Garanda, one of the de facto Hollywood um, kind of trainers of trainers back in the 40s and 50s and early 60s, who was a big advocate of organ meats and glandulars and nutrition, was way, way ahead of his time. And there is a what I would say a resurgence of that philosophy here in the West and in certain pockets of the fitness and performance industry. Can you share with our listeners why or how consuming organ meats has been a, a big thing for you? What, what led you to come to that conclusion? Cause it's like, not everybody wakes up one day and says, you know what? I need to eat a kidney today. Or, you know, like, or what's the difference between eating a heart versus a kidney versus a liver? Like, yeah. What is this whole thing? Can you explain that or what attracted to it and maybe explain some of the nuances about organ meat consumption? Yeah, I mean, I could go all day. So you stop me when when you want to, because um, it is a very- I'll, I'll interject if yes. I have a question. So how yes, about we'll, go, we'll, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll, I'll do that. That would advance. be great. That yeah. would be great. Because yeah, I mean, this is still definitely like sort of a niche conversation. But when you think about, you know, keto- 10 years ago was super niche. Paleo 15 years ago was super niche. Everyone thought it was just a weird trend clickbait. And now there's, you know, 400 uh, cookbooks in Barnes and Noble on each of those topics. And so I, I still hold out hope that there is going to be, like you said, a continuing resurgence. And I think it is almost like a, like a response to in the fitness world, 
over the past number of years, there's been sort of this biohacking concept, which that can be a whole different rabbit hole we can go down and the pros and cons of that. But there is always, whenever we go in one direction, there's always sort of a backlash in the other. And with the idea of biohacking being like fringe experimental stuff, there, there is now sort of maybe a, a, and I don't want to use the word backlash necessarily, but just sort of like a different way of looking at, let's actually go back to basic principles. Let's go back to really simple, natural um, methods of, of being as healthy as we possibly can. And for me, my background nutritionally, whenever I started caring about nutrition, which was again, probably in my mid twenties, when I realized I had to start caring about nutrition, you know, everybody hits that point. Well, you look they... like, for those who are watching, you look like you're in your mid twenties now. So what you're I'm doing is close. working. We'll say that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but you know, you, you know, you like, you hit that age where like your metabolism starts like telling you it's there or not. And you start, you know, just feeling like you need to take better care of yourself because you're not a teenager anymore. So when that happened to me, um, and I was learning about, you know, weightlifting and stuff like that. And so I started caring about nutrition and food as fuel. Around that time, I was learning about this paleo diet or this ancestral health diet. And it always made sense to me just because it seemed so practical. Like I was, it was like the anti-biohacking. It was like, this is boils down to physiology. This is how our actual bodies work and what they respond to. And so it just made sense, right? Um, and I still believe, you know, at a very basic level that the concept of eating whole unprocessed foods, ideally that are local to where you live, that are fresh, um, that don't have an ingredients list, I still believe that makes the most sense for most people. And that can look very different to, you know, across the board, like my paleo meal can be a massive steak with some like chives on it. Yours could be a huge salad with maybe a little smattering of, of animal protein, you know, so they can look very different, but I think those basic concepts make sense, right? So that's kind of always the way I've thought of nutrition for myself. And as I was continuing to learn about these things and learn about the sustainability and, and um, you know, just kind of doing it in the best way possible in a way that promotes our own personal individual health, but also supports sustainable agriculture and, um, you know, supports local farms and supports a humane way of doing this because Again, I mean, it's another rabbit hole we could go down plant-based versus animal-based, but for the vast majority of us who do eat animal products, I think we can all agree that we want to do it in a way that is as, as humane, as healthy um, as we can possibly do it, right? So along that trajectory, I'm thinking the best way to do this is to um, support local farmers who are doing this in, in the best way possible, that are giving animals the healthiest, best lives possible. We want to do it in a way that is wasting as little as possible. Um, and so then we're thinking what true nose to tail means, of course, that's going to include organ meats. And the more I delved into that, the more I realized that organ meats, which were, are more recently something that we throw away or think of as extreme, are the most nutrient dense parts of an animal. So if we are going to accept that, that an animal is going to lose its life to nourish us, why wouldn't we then take advantage as much as we possibly can by making use of the entire animal, respecting it in that way, eating the parts that are the most healthy and nourishing for us. Instead, what we're doing is we're eating, you know, the, the choice cuts and in many cases, throwing, throwing the nutrient dense parts away or giving it to other people or other, you know, places, which just didn't make a lot of sense to me. So I started exploring this more personally for myself and I started just kind of dipping my toe in and like trying some different things and cooking some different things. And as I was doing this, I was like sharing it with my followers or my social media. And I was getting a lot of um, responses, people like a lot of barf emojis, um, but also a lot of people saying, what are you like? What, what, what are you doing? What, what, what caused the barf emojis? I'm curious. Liver, like usually liver, right. usually. Yeah. And I mean, oftentimes it's, it's and, and just what yeah. constitutes um, an organ meat per se, like is cow's tongue considered an organ or is that considered just a, another muscle in the body? Like how would that, like yeah. what's an organ versus regular meat for our listeners who might not be versed in those concepts. 
technically it's anything that isn't well there is sort of a gray area because it's anything that's kind of not muscle meat um but as you just alluded to a lot of organs are also muscle meat so things like heart and tongue are muscles but they're also considered organs so from a very basic description like an organ is any um collective of tissues that serves a specific purpose so that can be skin is considered an organ um but of course everything from you know brain down to you know your guts like tripe things like that to sex organs everything that's just sort of a specific set of tissues that do a job is an okay organ. okay so so we, we just we, we went from brain to sex organs so now we just went down Head a whole sideways <laughs> so what's 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 the what's the most uh, what's what's the weirdest thing that you've eaten well, it's so funny because I, it's hard for me to answer questions like that now because my perspective is so different because I right. don't, but no, no, I, don't I know, think but it's weird, right? Like, well, there must've like, been a point where you're like, all right, I got beaver balls here. And like, yeah. here we go. You're like, you know, like what's yeah, the weird, yeah. come on. Like, so like, you I, know what I mean? I like, will tell you, I will or tell got you. monkey brains or something, you know what I mean? Cause these I are mean, things that are served around the world. Absolutely. And I mean, I haven't, I haven't tried a whole lot of super exotic animal parts just because they're hard to source. Of course I would. And when I travel, I'll eat whatever is the thing that people eat there. But I will say like in the process of, of recipe development and testing and making some recipes for the book, I did have a couple days and moments where I was like purchasing things. And I was like, how did I get to this moment? This is weird, <laughs> you know, but I, you get over it. So like, for example, I have a couple recipes that involve blood um, and blood has traditionally been used because it's very protein rich. It's very iron rich, tons of vitamins and minerals. It's used as like a thickener. It's also used to rich, enrich flavors that are already there. So, you know, like in the way that people will often put espresso in chocolate desserts because it makes the flavor richer blood does that as well so i've you know made traditional kind of black pudding blood sausage which is very good and i even made a um a chocolate pudding with blood that's based on a very well-known italian recipe that was delicious but i remember having to go to the butcher and ask for blood and the butcher kind of knew me at this point so they were used to the girl coming in asking for weird stuff but they were like man i mean okay, I guess I can get you some blood, but it's going to be a lot of it because we don't buy, like, we don't, we don't have like little pre-portioned things of blood for people because no one wants it. So I remember like walking home with like a few liters of like frozen blood and thinking like, okay, how am I going to explain this to my friends and family, you know? Right, but, right. But right. every time I do this, every time I tried something new that was a little bit intimidating to me, because it, it still, anything that's unfamiliar is going to be a little bit intimidating. Um, but I would do it and it would be successful eventually. And it was something that I enjoyed. And I just felt empowered the same way I think many people who try new things in the kitchen you do it, you learn something and you feel good. You feel like you're empowered. Like you learned something about how to cook and take care of yourself and, and you've tried something new and that's fun. So, I mean, I'm pretty much willing to try anything. I will admit there are some organs and some, some dishes that I don't like. I think I have a pretty extensive palate and I'll eat a lot and I'll enjoy a lot. There are some that I don't and that's okay. Like that's another thing I want people to know about this book is I'm not telling everybody they have to eat kidney all day, every day and like it. I'm just saying, if you are somebody who eats meat, but you think that, you know, this part of the animal is okay because you're used to it. And this part over here is extreme and weird and gross just because you're not used to it. I just want people to, to open their minds and kind of question their mm -hmm. preconceived notions about things that are different, right? Like just because it's different doesn't mean it's bad. And that goes for everything in life, not just food. That's what I want people to kind of think about. So uh, bags of blood aside, <laughs> 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 what is... Um, Let's get into maybe some of the, the, the scientific aspects um, about why someone might select choosing a particular organ or from a different animal. Is it just because it's calories and we don't want to waste it? Or is there some specific nutritive benefits for people? Mm -hmm. And what might um, be some of the common ones, I guess? Yeah. So in my uh, research, what I have found to be, and, and I'm sure, again, you, you know, a lot of this stuff too, like anybody who does a lot of research in the nutrition world, there's, there's talk of superfoods. And again, if you kind of take the clickbaity terms away, we're talking about like 
ounce for ounce nutrient dense foods. And those include things like oysters and things like, you know, blueberries maybe. And, and the big one that comes up over and over again is beef liver. And the reason for that is because again, it just ounce for ounce has the highest numbers of an array. Like I can list them. I have them written down here in my notebook because I don't want to memorize everything. Every vitamin and mineral you can think of, it just has it in such high numbers that we're talking about bang for your buck here. Like if you, if you're somebody who maybe recognizes the, the importance for your health of eating animal products, but you want to reduce it because you don't want to contribute too much to, to, you know, eating a ton of animal products all the time. So you, you want to eat animal products for your health. You just don't want to eat a lot of it. You do not need to eat a 12 ounce beef steak every other day to maintain sort of the benefits. People are eating a couple ounces of liver maybe once a week and you are reaping really impressive benefits like everything from antioxidants um, like CoQ10 and, and things like that to all the B vitamins, iron, every, everything you can imagine is in beef liver. So in talking about animals, right? Um, liver is gonna be the most nutrient dense part of pretty much any animal. I often recommend people start with chicken liver just because the smaller the animal, the milder the flavor of anything tends to be. So if you're kind of like, again, dipping your toe in the water and you're a little bit nervous about flavor or texture, you start with smaller animals and you can work your way up. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes different cuts tend to taste of the animal. So for example, I really like uh, lamb personally, I think that it has a nice flavor and a lot of people like the taste of lamb. And if you, for example, were to purchase a lamb heart, it's going to have a lamby flavor. So lamb mm -hmm. heart tastes different than beef heart tastes different than chicken heart and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think that in, you know, so again, it, depending on your unique challenge or your requirements, or if you're, you find yourself kind of, um, uh, deficient in certain vitamins and minerals, you might want to go for different things. Like again, heart is super high in a lot of these um, minerals, but it's really high in CoQ10, which is a anti-inflammatory antioxidant. So that's maybe a great option for people. I also recommend heart for people because as we mentioned before, it's a muscle meat. So if you're worried about texture, which a lot of people are with things like liver and kidney and, and stuff like that, it has a very beefy texture that is familiar and more appealing to meat eaters than maybe other things. Um, so, and I, you know, again, there's all this information is in the book and I don't, I don't think that people need to necessarily obsess over, you know, I have to eat cooked beef liver because that's the most nutrient dense. I think that if again, we're just talking about trying to have generally speaking a nutrient dense diet that involves plants and animals and fruits and things like that, that thinking about using the whole animal, it just makes sense. Like if you're, you know, muscle meat is just an inferior product, honestly, if we're talking about nutrient density. So um, why not kind of look at ways you can explore that and enjoy it. It doesn't have to be something you choke down. I know lots of people who take, you know, they freeze beef liver and kind of swallow it like a pill. And look, if you want to do that and that works for you, great, but there's plenty of ways to enjoy it. And I think that it just involves a little bit of work and experimentation and some adventurousness in the kitchen. And I always kind of liken it to things like we always, we all grew up and our parents maybe made us sit at the table for a while because we didn't want to eat our vegetables, right? Everybody has like a boiled Brussels sprout story, right? We had to sit at the table because they're gross. It's squash for me. Oh, like why was everything boiled growing up? I don't know. Anyway, so, but we didn't grow up thinking I'm never going to eat a vegetable again because I had gross boiled vegetables when I was young and they were gross. We are taught that these are healthy and good for us. And so you figure out a way to enjoy them. You make it worth it. Or at some point you grow up and realize you're an adult and not everything needs to taste like a Big Mac or a Pop-Tart, right? Like some things are, are fuel and they aren't not, not everything you eat should be hyper palatable anyway. Um, but yeah, I just tell people, I'm like, look, everybody has a, a boiled Brussels sprout story and everybody has a liver and onions nightmare story from their childhood. There are better ways to do it. You just have to get in the kitchen and experiment and try some things. Yeah. Re really, uh, great po points. Um, when you talk about your book, it takes guts. What's the book about? And who is the book for? Yes. So the book is about, the book is for anyone who, um, I'm not trying to convince anybody who, who doesn't want to eat 
animal products, especially for ethical reasons to do that. I think that the book is really for anyone who does or is interested in eating animal products and wants to do it. W in warning, this is not a book on ethics, folks. It's just about, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is my choice and we're going, we're going down sure. the road. So we're not but making, I, we, I and do we don't make moral and ethical judgments here on the podcast. We're here to share and inform people about possibilities in your journey to mm -hmm. biological optimization. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, cause it is, it is a, it's an intense topic for a lot of people and that's, that's for every individuals to make their own decision. Right. I think that this is just, I want it to be encouraging and positive and informative and entertaining for those of us who are willing to, to enter into this area of eating nose to tail, um, by explaining to people that this has actually been a very common way of human eating for pretty much all of human history across every culture until very recently. And even most cultures, except for maybe Western North American culture, it's still a very common practice. I get, for every person who sends me a barf emoji, I, I get somebody who's like, hey, I'm from Mexico or I'm from Japan or I'm from somewhere and this is totally, I'm into this, I eat this all the time. So I wanted to kind of give people a little bit of history, talk a little bit about culture and, and, and different ways to enjoy this kind of food. I give like full breakdowns of um, every kind of ingredient that I use in the book and how it can be prepared and why it's um, beneficial and healthy and all the kind of breakdown there. Um, and most of the recipes have a story, like a personal story. I have a couple friends who are chefs and recipe developers who submitted some recipes. And I also kind of have like a, a personal story to go along with each one because I recognize that these are atypical ingredients. And I just really want people to feel um, like just sort of encouraged and positive. Like this isn't a scary thing. It doesn't have to be scary. This can just be fun. And I've had people who had the book tell me like, I just read it like it was a book. And that's really, that makes me really happy because I want this to be a lot more than just, hey, here's a kidney recipe, go to town, good luck. You know, I want people to just be educated and, and entertained and, and, you know, have fun with it. Um, and so it's for everybody who's, who's willing to just kind of learn something new about nutrition, I suppose, and, and try something maybe in the kitchen. Um, yeah, that's it. What are some of the benefits that you've experienced or your clients have experienced from, you know, taking in organ meats? What, what's kind of maybe the, if you have some supporting data or even some anecdotal stories, because I think both are relevant. And just as go on a tangent here for our listeners, I am a big advocate of clinical experience, experiments as opposed to double blind studies. And here's why. In a double blind study, very seldom do you get complete compliance and adherence to the protocols. The protocols are often very difficult to replicate in real life. And the variance within the subjects is not factored into most of the research based on genetics and history and deficiencies and things like that. Where we break away from that is with people who have clinical experience, such as yourself, which that is you're dealing with real people in the real world with real problems who have tried umpteen different things. And then they say, hey, I added organ meats to my diet and bingo, this happened. So I'd, I'd be, I'd be I'm curious as to what you noticed and maybe some, some stories about some other people that this was life changing for them. Yeah, I completely agree with everything you said. Um, I think that if, if folks are looking for more science-backed, um, research-backed information, there are better people to talk to than me, like Dr. Kate Shanahan's a great example. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you uh, research people like Diana Rogers, um, who are really doing a lot more sort of work in this field. I'm not a registered dietitian. I'm not a functional nutritionist. I'm, I, I've done some courses in that area, but I'm really much more of a, like a journalist, honestly, than a than a like clinician. Um, and I am a health coach too, but again, most of what I can speak to is, um, anecdotal. And for myself personally, it's, again, it's one of those things where it's hard to say, like, I'm not, I'm never going to go out there and say, because I eat liver all the time, I'm the healthiest person in the world and I'm healthier than you. And I'm healthier than I was even five years ago. I can't say that for sure. What I can say is that I know that 
since I have incorporated high quality organ meats in my diet, I have not been sick. I have enjoyed really robust health. And I can tell you also that personally, when I eat liver specifically, when I eat liver, I feel nourished and energized in a way that I, it sounds almost corny for me to say it out loud in a way that I have never felt eating or doing anything else. It's like you take a shot of, I don't know, like an energy drink, except without the grossness of an energy drink. Like it just, Mm -hmm. it's, it, it is so nourishing. And I think that a lot of people have that experience maybe when they switch from a standard American diet to a more nutrient dense diet to organic vegetables or organic. um, Like I remember having a similar transformative experience when I had a organic free range chicken for the first time, instead of like your normal grocery store rotisserie chicken Mm -hmm. and being like, this is a different animal, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, It is. And it, 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 and it is. And I think a lot of people don't recognize that just like, um, a, a Twinkie eating city dweller is very different than someone who has l- grown up their entire life on the African savanna or, yep. you know, in a, in a, in an Arctic, uh, fishing village. Mm-hmm. They're very different humans in their physiology, their what's inside them and all that sort of stuff. So of course it makes sense. I think a lot of people don't recognize how much our food has changed. Uh, with industrialization. I always call it the unintended consequences of technological innovation. The Bioptimizer mission is to help more of the world fix their digestion at a core level. The truth is your digestion is only as good as your enzyme levels. Imagine trying to build a house with a tree. It's impossible. You need to chop the tree down into small pieces. Similarly, in order for your food to be used by your body, it must be broken down into a bioavailable form. And that's what enzymes do converting protein into amino acids, fats into specific fatty acids, and carbohydrates into usable energy units. We start out with an abundance of enzymes, and that's why kids can digest just about anything really quickly. The thing is, is cooking food kills enzymes as they cannot survive at temperatures above 118 degrees. So years of this ends up depleting our bodies and leads to weak digestion. Taking digestive enzymes like masszymes, which has an incredibly high level of protease for digesting protein, as well as other critical enzymes like lipase, amylase, and others is a total game changer. Suddenly, you strengthen your digestion, eliminate gas and bloating, boost metabolism, and multiply your energy. Most importantly, you fix your digestion at a core level. To get started with Masszymes and to save 10% on your first order, go to Masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S dot com and use the code MASS10, M-A-S-S-1-0. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I was going to say too, is I think so many people, again, in the, in the nutrition world, we focus so much on macronutrients and calories. We are not thinking about possibly the bigger issue for like longevity and and real sustainable health, which is micronutrients and the deficiency that we have and gut health, which is another thing you can of course speak to really well. Um, but we, all of us, even the healthiest among us in this modern world struggle with nutrient deficiencies because of our lifestyle, because of chronic stress. Maybe we live in a place where there's no sun. Hello, Ontario in the winter. Um, you know, so we're all struggling with this. It's incredibly difficult at this point. It's not just eat healthy, eat your fruits and vegetables and you'll be fine. That's often not the case. It's a great start. Um, but I think that again, a lot of my, um, maybe clients that I've worked with who are so focused on maybe body composition or hitting your macro so you look a certain way and they're they're not thinking about again nutrient density and the fact that maybe they're stalling or maybe they're having health issues even when they look good because the food that they're eating is not actually nourishing their body and i just think that it's it has such an impact because of the um the the I keep saying these words, nutrient density, but you're eating a small amount of this food that is incredibly bioavailable, um, that your body is able to absorb if you've got good gut health. Um, and people just notice such a significant difference so quickly, um, that it's just, to me, it seems like a very low risk, high reward proposition for most people. It's like, look, just try it. If you're already eating steak and ground beef and chicken thighs, 
put some chicken liver in there, like try some heart, try some, you know, whatever, sweet bread, spleen, like just try it and see what happens. And I, I haven't had anybody tell me this was a bad decision. So I know we're, um, by Optimize, we're coming out with a, we have an author that's coming out with the carnivore cookbook. And I was shocked when I saw that he's making bread with meat and I'm like, okay, I that's, saw, I saw meat bread recipe. I was recently. like meat yeah. bread. Okay. Who knew? And you know, one of the beauties of doing this podcast and talking to so many people like yourself is that we have um, such a vast array of perspectives and you come up and expose oneself to all of the biases and a bias people to understand is kind of the accepted norms based on your exposure to your social environment. And so, for example, I remember when I first went to China and I'm seeing dead dogs in, 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 in the hanging in the meat shops, right? And things I would never consider eating. And I'm like, wow. And then you go to another culture and, you know, like you go to Japan and there's all this raw fish that people are wiggling and they're just eating it, right? And, and then you, you see on, you know, tribesmen in Africa digging up ants and just eating them or beetles. And then you go to uh, another place and then you, like, you know, India where there's a lot of people that are plant-based and are, uh, you know, don't hear that. And so what you start to realize, the more that you expose yourself to is that, wow, there's a whole lot of things that I don't know. And the tendency is to be suspicious or to carry a bias or a judgment into something. And I think if you're going to really embrace super health, mm -hmm. that one needs to expose yourself to these things and be curious and curiosity as they said killed the cat but satisfaction brought him back and i think it's really important to be curious and to maintain that curiosity like a childlike and to recognize that when you come up against biases or uh, aversions mm -hmm. um, so one of my spiritual teachers uh, talks about how you become consciously aware of attractions and aversions what are you attracted to what are you aversion to tony robbins talks about that you're moving towards values and you're moving away from values and these are actually much more malleable than we think if we're willing to experiment and grow with it so uh, kudos to you for bringing that up and and sharing that with people because i think oftentimes and i've seen this we just wrote a we were just talking about um, this today, my business partner, I, people are always, you know, they're always shocked that Matt's a keto guy and I'm a plant-based guy. And, and, and we go, well, how does that work? And they're like, well, we're dietary agnostic. It's like, there you go. it's whatever works for you and experiment and, and optimize the diet that you're on. But I think it's really important to, to, to maintain this and, and to get away from what I call dietary tribalism. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and that is these are the rules of my tribe and if you break them you're an infidel and mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that just keeps firing up the diet circus all the time as the marigold goes around and around and, I, and, and we're here to bust out all of those things any other um you mentioned just briefly in your testimonial there that a lot of people found a difference and i want to dive a little bit deeper like for example you say that you're sustained by beef liver, you, 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 there's a noticeable, palpable, physiological response when you eat that. What's some of the things that other people might find? Is it the same? Is it beef liver is the number one thing? Or is there something else? Is there like... Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I just, I just want to like, um, follow up on what you said, cause I think it's so important what you just said. And I think it's a big, big kind of actually scary topic, not only in the, in the nutrition world, but in like the world in general is this concept of, uh, sort of tribalism or I'm right versus you're wrong kind of thing. And, and I can understand why it can be complicated and scary, um, right now because of the way our global world works. We're so inundated with information and we're all we're often so inundated with 
clickbaity stuff that is meant to provoke and divide and get people worked up. And, you know, um, I've talked about this a lot that even people in my community or in like my, my sphere where I'm supposed to agree with everything they say, I'm often turned off by a lot of the way that people communicate, which is like meant to be divisive, which I really think, again, people are focusing more on who, how can we get more eyes on us versus how can we make a difference? And I've struggled with this too, because I'm like, Hey, I bet if I said more crazy clickbait stuff, uh, more people would pay attention to me, but that's not really the way I want to get my message out. I just feel like maybe because I have two psychologist parents, but I, I learned that's another topic we could go down. You but just need to walk down the street with, with a, with a leather holding. underworld, a leather underworld kind of outfit with two bags of blood and, 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 and the question, you know, like find out you why in? on the <laughs> caption or right. Who's right. coming with me? Like if who's you coming only with me knew. for the apocalypse? Yeah. But I just, <laughs> You know, I of course, just, the hate that comes is also the other part of it, but that's sure. That's but I, I guess, yeah, I just feel like psychology, if we're being pragmatic again, we do not change. If you're out there to try to make people healthier or give people an option to, to be healthier and happier, you never change anyone's mind by making them feel stupid Correct. and, and by being insensitive and mean and rude to people. It just isn't how our brains work. So it doesn't make any sense. We still do it because I get, I get it. People are frustrated. People are like, I just want you to know this thing. And why don't you know it? Why won't you hear me and listen? And so I, I understand the frustration that we're, we all feel, I think, when we turn on the news, go on the internet, go on social media. But I just, I really appreciate what you said, because I do think that more conversations with people who can be you know, again, kind of separate your emotions or separate your personality from the the lessons you're trying to teach or learn this like nutrition agnostic thing. I just, I really appreciate that. And I really like that. So, um, but yeah, so going back to the, the health benefits thing, I think that the, the major part of it for, um, the people that I work with, it tends to be pretty, again, pretty like vague markers, but important ones and things like improved immunity um, for people who have super, super high stress, hard charging um, lives, um, increased uh, energy and performance in the gym, which is again, something that, you know, I can only say anecdotally that they're telling me I feel better. I have better energy and things like that. Um, and I also think it's, it's little tiny things where somebody who's generally pretty healthy, pretty sorted out, but maybe they're like severely um, B12 or vitamin D uh, deficient and they don't really know it. And they're kind of just hanging on because the rest of their stuff's sort of okay. And when these sort of levels start to, or these, these kind of things start to level out and everything's kind of coming more in balance, it's sort of just like a cascading effect for everything. Your sleep gets better, your digestion gets better, um, your mood gets better, your performance in the gym gets better. So it's, it's really like, I wouldn't say like, I'm not going to market like eat beef for better sex or like eat liver. Cause it'll help you sleep better. I really think it's one of those things that it's just, well, a didn't you know it was avocados? Oh, yeah. Avocados <laughs> for, for better sex and sleep. Yeah. Uh, hey, I'll go with that too. I eat a lot of avocados. So yeah. I'm cool I, with it. I buy, I, I, I'll buy into that. But, yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do I need to eat right now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Switching gears. Um, Thank you for that, by the way. I really appreciate that. And I think that if as an overarching philosophy, if what you're currently doing or the philosophy that you currently are advocating in life, and I'm, list I'm talking to you, the listener, if, if it's not leading you where you want to go, you need to experiment some, with some things that you may be averse to or not like, or say no. And that oftentimes is the breakthrough that you have. And I've seen this so many times with people who are advocates of a plant-based diet, switch to a meat diet for whatever reason and have remarkable results. I see the opposite way too. And there's advantages and disadvantages to every dietary philosophy. Yep. And there is a time period where a person will grow gain the benefits of it and then they begin to diminish and some of the liabilities will show up so being being able to 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 cycle through variances and do testing and expertise i think is the intelligence approach to the world today and 
one of the biggest parts of that, that I, I find when I work with clients is going back to, again, what you said, sort of taking the like tribalism or the connection with your identity out of it makes a big difference with this because one of the biggest problems is that people give themselves such a hard time when something stops working that used to work for them because they personalize it and say, it's because I'm failing or because I didn't do Correct. it good enough or I, I was wrong. Whereas I'm trying to, to coach people a lot of times that for example, if someone was on a strict keto, ketogenic diet, maybe they were super overweight, maybe they lost 75 pounds in a year incredible. And then it plateaued and maybe their libido went down and their energy went down and they're kind of having some craving issues. And they're like, Oh, I just, I'm not good enough. I can't keep doing it. I, I, you know, I'm mm -hmm. failing. And it's like, maybe the thing that served you before is not serving you anymore. And that's okay. Um, but we get it in our head, this black and white I'm keto now carbs are bad. Now I can never do that again. If I do that, I'm backsliding. Um, so I like to encourage people to think of any of these methodologies, whether it's fasting or keto or plant-based or just, you know, any kind of thing like that, that they're using and incorporating into their diet as a tool instead of an identity or a lifestyle. I, I don't consider, I'm not like paleo lifestyle or I'm carnivore adjacent lifestyle, or I'm a intermittent faster. I just have these tools in my toolbox that I use when I need to and put them away when they aren't working anymore. It has no bearing on my, you know, goodness as a person or my ability to kind of do the things I need to do in life. And I just, I, I feel for people because it's, it can be very emotional and it can be so tied into how you feel about yourself. And I just wish people would give themselves a little break. Just give yourself a little bit of grace. You, you're doing something good and now you're switching just like everybody else. We're all doing it. We're all constantly evolving. So, you know, yeah. give yourself one, a break. One of, one of the maxims my spiritual teacher said, be uh, kind and loving to everyone and everything, no matter what, especially including yourself. Yes. So I think that's really important. Um, switching gears though a little bit because um, before we started the podcast, we talked something about youth say is really cool about strength and mobility and particularly for females. And that is you are engaging in a pull-up program, which is a highly technical um, exercise that yes. a lot of women feel that they can't do a pull-up, but with the right training and the right technique, they can. And oftentimes that is massively transformational for people's kind of self-view or their ability to consider themselves as strong or fit or athletic. Yes. Can you talk about your pull-up program uh, that you've been doing? Why did you get involved? How did that happen? And, and, and what have you learned? Yes, I am so excited about this. Um, these are kind of my two babies this year, my pandemic babies who are the, right. the book and this program, this program I've actually been working on for years. Um, and I sort of kept starting and stopping because I was second guessing myself and saying like, this is so specific and it's also really hard. Like, is this something I can actually put out that people are going to want to use? But like you said, I had such a transformative experience when I started doing gymnastics and body weight functional movements like this. And when I learned how to do pull-ups and, and then I was doing weighted pull-ups and then I was doing, um, you know, muscle ups and things like that. I just felt so good about myself. And I, one of the things I've learned through my fitness journey is that while everyone wants to look good and everyone will always want to look good, the path to true confidence, I strongly believe is through competency at things. And it can be physical competency. It can be you're really good at your job. You're a really good partner or parent. You're, you know, I don't know, a good friend, but learning skills and being good at things is going to give you way more confidence than a set of six packs, six pack. And I know this because I I've had a six pack. It was cool. Nobody really cared. You know, you yeah, take a nobody picture with a six pack and then six people pack. move on. Nobody, nobody cares. cares about it. No, so they if don't. you think that's going to, you know, move the needle for you, like I, you know, you can go and try it. Everybody needs to make their own mistakes, but I know that it doesn't, you know, whatever. So anyway, I feel very, very strongly about functional fitness because I think it gives people real inherent confidence that they can take into other areas of life. And there is very few things you can do in the gym that are less functional than a strict, smooth, nice 
pull up. I just, I love them. I think they're so awesome and it's so good. And women have been taught, you know, a lot that like upper body strength is not really our thing. And we start at a pretty big disadvantage, which is true. We do have a lot less upper body um, muscle and strength doesn't mean we can't learn it. But I mean, if you even look at things like and it is changing with like sort of modern fitness industry and things like CrossFit showing people how strong women actually are. But, you know, you look at like firefighter and military fitness um, qualifications. And I think some of this is changing, but it used to be like men had to do five pull-ups and women just kind of had to hang there because it was just assumed that we just mm-hmm. couldn't do the same thing, which I call BS on that big time personally. Um, but yeah, so I really just wanted to provide a program that was um, based on functional upper body strength. It's really core, back, arms, shoulders, kind of the whole deal. Because as you know, a pull-up is a lot more than just your arms, which is one of the big fallacies of trying to get a pull-up. It's for men and women. I've got men and women in the program because I see a lot of dudes doing bad ones too, to be honest with you, like kind of the like half range of motion ones. I want people getting like a real good pull-up. There's some mobility work in there too. And it's a lot of obviously on the bar work as well as um, uh, accessory movements that are gonna help people not only build the strength that you need to get a pull up, but also recruit the muscles properly because one of the, um, one of the issues I think with people getting a proper pull up is not being able to recruit the muscles that you need. A lot of people kind of try to go really arm heavy um, instead of recruiting these big, strong muscles in your back. Cause we don't, we, a lot of these muscles are turned off, right? Like we've yeah, got this Ben, modern- Ben, Ben Pakulski, who you mentioned is probably one of the premier guys on muscle recruitment and mm-hmm. activation um, in regards to that. Of course, he was a former student of Scott Abel, who was my coach also really big on learning how to pull the shoulder blades back and activate these big muscle movers of your back and shoulders and maintaining your ab structure and all these sort of things. And what's interesting, once someone has actually shown you these components, it's like all of a sudden you get all your muscles working in uh, with each other or, you know, protagonistically or instead of antagonistically. Mm -hmm. And that is transformative in yourself. Uh, in itself. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's really, really cool that you're doing. So when you're doing a pull-up program, can you say what would a pull-up program sort of look like someone saying, Hey, I want to do a pull-up. I've been told I can't do a pull-up. I want to do one. Yeah. Let me do your program. What what, what does that look like? Yeah. Well, I think one of the reasons this took so long is because originally I was kind of going to go the, the, the standard online fitness route and create a program, put it in a PDF and say, here you go, go for it. Um, And then I soon realized that I think people needed a little bit more support and more resources than that. So I ended up um, putting this program on an online platform. It's not an app, it's web-based because I didn't want people to have to download an app because I think that's annoying personally, but you know, whatever, people can do what they want. Anyway, it's a web-based program that people can go in um, that has a a sort of a full video library so that you can see every single movement. I show you how to do it right, how to do it wrong. It's just my face painstakingly showing you how to do scapular pushups and things like that. Um, But it also, and it, so it like lists out the days, um, you know, in a progressive way so that you know what workouts you're supposed to be doing and when. One of the most important parts about the program and one of the things I love the most that's so unique is um, through this program, this portal, you have access to me personally to ask me questions, to talk about the program. You can say, you know, I tried doing X, Y, Z exercise and it kind of doesn't make sense. Can you help me? Or can you give me, um, a different thing to try instead? Or, you know, I did this benchmark and I have questions and I'm going in there and personally. So it's like, I'm your kind of your personal pull-up coach, um, through this program, which has been so rewarding for me because I get people to come in and give me feedback on what's working or what isn't. Um, but also people coming in and telling me like, these workouts are hard, but I feel like I'm getting stronger and it's making my tennis better. And I'm better at this thing now. And like, I'm starting to see some muscles in my back and it's so awesome and so rewarding. So the program is quite unique because it's about as interactive as I can get it in today's world where I can't be in the gym with you guys. Um, but, and I think it's really clear. It's like really kind of well laid out. And of course it exists there forever. So the program technically lasts a month, but it's meant to be repeated. And the way that the workouts um, are done, it can be 
you know, progressive and scaled and, and made more difficult or less depending on what you need. Um, so yeah, I've had, I've had really great feedback. I've had some, some people making some pretty incredible progress. And every time I see somebody post on social media and it's showing them hanging from a bar, doing a pull up, it just makes me so happy. So, um, yeah, it's been really fun. And um, before we go, can we talk about a little bit about the Muscle Maven podcast? <laughs> so like, I love the word, by the way, Maven for me and muscle put them together as two of my like go-to words ever. Nice. So uh, great name on the podcast. Can you talk about the podcast and what's that all about for people who want to tune in? Yeah. And I've got to have you on it, by the way, Wade, because we actually had a very um, successful IG live um, a while back. So I think that it yeah. just only makes sense to have you on to talk some more um muscle maven radio is my podcast the the name really it's funny because the name actually came about like five or six years ago because i created an instagram handle to um document my bodybuilding competitions because this right. was back when like people i mean i was still using facebook which i don't really anymore and i was like ah i want to i want to document this experience but i don't want to like annoy my friends with like pictures of my sweet potato all the time. Like, should I, you know, go somewhere different so that if they're interested, they can come to me. And so I didn't, I didn't put my name on it. So I was just like, you know, look, I'm in marketing. I'm a writer. Like it was a stroke of genius. I was like muscle maven. That's me. And it just kind of stuck. It's, it's, you know, it's my name now. Um, people literally message me on Instagram and they're like, Hey, maven. I'm like, that's, you know, that's not my name. Right. But it's cool. If you like it, you can right. call me Maven all you want. Um, but anyway, so Muscle Maven Radio just sounds better than my name. My name's too hard to say. Um, and it's really just, again, kind of a, an evolution of my work with Paleo Magazine Radio, where I talked a lot about nutrition and ancestral health. This is sort of me kind of going in my own direction and, and instead just talking about a wider range of topics around health and wellness. So um, anything from nutrition to I'm talking to professional athletes and their coaches and um, functional medicine um, for women and, and hormonal health and stuff like that. There is sort of a lean towards women's health just because I'm a woman and I felt like there's like a little bit of that lacking in the like meathead space. I'm a meathead, but I'm also a woman. And I feel like every podcast I listen to is just dudes talking about dude stuff which is great, but you know, I want to hear some lady meatheads every once in a while too. So there's a little bit of that, but there's lady meatheads. I love <laughs> yeah, that one. There's certainly stuff in there for everybody. You know, I think my audience is about 50, 50. So I, you know, I don't want to exclude anybody. Um, but again, it's like, we just, we're talking about, it's just an excuse for me to talk to people. I think are interesting and learn, and then other people get to listen and learn from it too. So it's like the best gig ever. Um, yeah, that's it. it. I love yep. it. Yeah, you know, this, this I think that's the three stages of life: inclusion, exclusion, and then reclusion. Yeah, yeah basically. <laughs> um, where can people reach you? Get a hold of you? Uh, web, Facebook, social media, whatever. What, I said, you no, know, you're off that. And you're podcast. Where, where can people reach you and get connected with you to find out more about your book? It Takes Guts, your podcast, the Muscle Maven, or to nerd out with a new pull-up program to get stronger and more confident in your yes. capability to achieve physical excellence. I love it. Thank you. Um, I think the easiest way to do it would probably be either my website, which is just ashleyvanhouten.com. And there's an, sort of an email thing there. So you can reach out to me directly. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter there as well. Um, or Instagram at the muscle maven. I'm on there, frankly, way too much, but I'm there and happy to answer people's questions. Um, and you can find out more information like the book you can buy anywhere you buy books, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, whatever. And uh, the rest is, yeah, on my website or uh, on Instagram. Well, there you have it, folks. Ashley Van Houten, organ meets pull-ups. And bottom line, it takes guts to be a muscle maven in today's right. world. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And make sure you check out Ashley's site. She's a wealth of information and a lot of fun to hang out with, as you can see. And for those uh, who are joining us for the first time, welcome. We hope to see you again. And for those who have joined us uh, many, many times, we will be bringing you more uh, guests over the coming year. We've doubled down on our podcast production. We're getting more and more subscribers. So please do hit the subscribe or like button and share this with someone who might need it because 
That doesn't take scuts, but it does take a little effort. Thank you for joining us. I'm Way T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers and another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. See ya! And now for a Bioptimizers fixed digestion tip. How to get away with eating sugar. Hey, look, sugar is normally one of the worst things for you. But let's be honest. I mean, we all cheat from time to time. And here's a little trick that will ensure your body benefits from the sugar. Now, before you eat or drink anything sweet, take five to eight capsules of P3OM. The patented stream in the formula devours sugar so fast, it literally doubles in the body every 20 minutes in the presence of sugar. That doesn't mean that you can or you should eat a bunch of sugar or sit around all day doing that. But on the days that you do cheat or you go and go after one of those maybe meals that you wouldn't normally do, this ensures that you get something in your gut that eats the sugar. And it's not going to feed the bad guys or spike your blood glucose nearly as much. So to learn more about P3OM and its sugar devouring and protein digesting properties and how it can transform your gut and metabolism, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.